Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's present Excellus series events. I'm Dr. Francois Belanger, Vice President of Quality and Chief Medical Officer, and thank you for taking the time for your day to join us uh, here today. I would also uh, like to thank us, our hosts here at the Foothills Medical Center, as well as our telehealth staff for setting up uh, today's presentation. A lot of been work uh, behind the scenes to make these events happen, and we couldn't do it without these folks. Uh, also, this event is being recorded, uh, so if you're listening at, on uh, the phone line, you'll be able to watch the full presentation uh, in a week or so uh, uh, on Insight. We're thrilled to have uh, Stacy Chang as our keynote speaker today. Uh, Stacy is the Executive Director of the Design Institute for Health at the University of Texas. He's actually pulling double duty for us as he's also spoke at the Quality uh, and Safety Summit uh, yesterday that we're hosting here in Calgary. Um, today, he's going to share how the Design Institute of Health uh, is applying new design approaches to solve healthcare challenges and how we might be able to apply their successes to our own health system. Uh, we'll have 15 minutes for questions and answers following the presentation. And for those who aren't at the Foothills uh, Medical Center, you can email your questions at pss at ahs.ca. That's pss at ahs.ca. And for those of you who are on the audio line, you can email at pss at ahs.ca or, or for a copy of the presentation Stacy is using today. We'll uh, try to answer as many questions as we can before we run out of time. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Verna Yu, our president and CEO, to introduce uh, Stacy. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Francois, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm really happy to be here at the Foothills for another edition of the President's Speaker Series. And as uh, Francois said, we've got over 40 different sites in the province, so thank you for joining us. As you know, the President's Speaker Series is really an opportunity to bring together our staff, physicians, and volunteers, together with international experts and innovators to discuss ideas and advancements in healthcare. It's a chance for us to learn from other jurisdictions and other organizations and leading thinkers in healthcare from across the globe. And with that, I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Stacy Chang comes to us from Austin, Texas, holds advanced engineering degrees from both MIT and Stanford. And until 2014, he was the managing director of the healthcare practice at IDO, which is a global design and innovation firm. IDO is a really well-known global industry and just a very small personal story. My son just graduated from art and design at the University of Alberta and when I told him that I was actually going to be meeting somebody who used to work at IDO, he got very excited because for him IDO is the epitome of a design institute. So, um, so you are a celebrity in our household, Stacy. Stacy has uh, served as the Executive Director of Design Institute for Health in Austin. Uh, University of Texas. It's a collaboration and really first of its kind. It's very unique uh, between, the Delhi, uh, between the Dell Medical School and the College of Fine Arts at the University of Texas. And much like our own design lab within AHS, uh, the Design Institute sort of takes it to another step and uh, works from within to really embed design into every aspect of health systems. It's uh, really been established that we know that healthcare is one of the last frontiers to embrace design as a creative and human-centric approach to defining and solving problems. And so it's been real delight to learn what Stacy and his group has managed to do through the Design Institute and to how to ensure that every aspect of a health system uh, can actually get better uh, knowing that you've got design at the forefront. It considers topics as broad as how we design health products, services and facilities, and structure and functionality of the health system itself uh, to actually how we actually process things and how we actually do and think things different uh, outside of the health system. It really tries to ensure that the system meets the needs of everyone involved. And designing solutions from the perspectives of designers and from patients and families, we know lead to better outcomes. So I'm very thankful for that commitment. And again, as Francois said, uh, Stacey has been doing double duty, uh, both at the Quality and Safety Summit and here today. So we're working him very hard. But I really look forward to his talk today about how do we do better in bed design and healthcare. Thank you very much, Stacey. Well, it is a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I don't consider it double duty. I consider it a privilege to actually get to speak uh, on, <clears throat> on two venues. Um, 
And uh, for those of, us, those of you who may have uh, uh, tuned into the, the talk I gave yesterday, this one will be distinctly different. So hopefully we, uh, we'll keep you entertained. Um, <clears throat> I'll begin by, uh, so first of all, I have to admit, I'm a bit of a wanderer usually, but I've, I've been told I have to stay close to the microphone, so if I fidget, that'll be, that'll be the reason. Um, uh, as Verna was so kind to mention, um, my, the legacy of the Design Institute is inseparable from a company called IDEO, and, and I, I had mentioned before, you either know a lot about IDEO in the case Verna's uh, son does, uh, or you know very little bit about it at all, and, uh, and it's usually the latter. Most folks are not familiar with IDEO, and so, um, I'll, I'll share with you just a brief history of uh, my own and then the Design Institutes, but then I actually want to spend some time talking a bit about a case study of work that we've just finished that I think will be of particular relevance to Alberta Health, to Alberta Health Services um, and, um, and, and the providers in, in the province. So um, I spent the better part of 25 years at IDEO in and out of the firm. Um, and the work I did uh, leading the healthcare practice for the, for the 10 years before I left um, uh, covered a pretty broad array of the healthcare industry. And so I often said we were one of the very few firms who had the privilege of working literally on every aspect of the healthcare industry. Um, and so these images are uh, indicative, I think, of, of the work that we did. You know, we designed lots of hospitals, but always in the context of new care models. Um, we developed uh, uh, the Cleveland Clinic's uh, two phases of its hospital in Abu Dhabi. We did work in Singapore with the Changi General Hospital, and quite in pretty much every academic medical center in the U.S. And so we got quite used to trying to channel new aspirations in not only the built environment, but in the service models that supported them. Um, the second image there is uh, actually a, an image from a very, a very early shot of the, what was uh, originally called the Spark Innovation Center at, um, at the Mayo Clinic. Um, it is now called the Center for Innovation. And so we were the progenitors of not only Mayo's Innovation Center, but Kaiser Permanente's Innovation Consultancy and, and any number of others as well. <clears throat> and so our calling card was often uh, innovation, even though it was really design that we practiced. And that was the basis for what became innovation practices in a number of the academic medical centers of note. Um, we also had the privilege of working on the softer side of healthcare. So, um, uh, uh, healthcare, as we know it, is really about the medical establishment and the delivery of that, that model of care. We believed health was much broader than that, and so we intentionally worked um, in the, what we call the softer sides of health. So, everything from developing the industry leading Pilates machine to cosmeceuticals, uh, Fitbits, and wearables. Um, and because we were a resident in Silicon Valley, we got a front seat to all of the startups who were trying to rewrite the script. Um, in this case, we did work with Nike trying to help them figure out how to get pe people to stay uh, more active um, because it was a social good and also helped them sell shoes and, uh, and apparel as well. Um, <clears throat> Um, our forays uh, extended into um, government as well. We did a fair amount of work with Select Pharma and insurance, but we, we, uh, we thought we could have greater, a greater effect by actually working with government, and in some cases we did. Um, we were originally hired to develop the <clears throat> template for the health insurance exchanges. So when Obamacare was launched some years ago, the states were responsible for standing up their own health insurance exchanges. We wrote the template for how to engage individuals in the selection of their own health insurance. Um, eventually, 38 of the uh, 50 U.S. states decided they wouldn't do it, and so the feds had to do it themselves. Um, they royally screwed it up <coughs> and then called us up afterwards to actually fix it for them. So we fixed the interface and uh, some other folks fixed the software. Um, but the legacy of, of, the, of the health practice at IDEO um, uh, uh, comes from uh, product design. And by the time I had left, something less, less than 20% of our work was in medical product design. Um, but um, that was still our legacy and something we held on to quite dearly. Um, the picture shown here is uh, the industry standard, what we call, a, it's um, the, uh, uh, for a company called Organ Recovery Systems. It's called the Lifeport, Lifeport Kidney Transporter. It is the standard of care um, for what happens when you harvest a kidney and, and, and before you shuttle it off to get implanted into a new patient. Um, the previous standard of care was an ego cooler with ice packs, so we've come a long way. Um, so. When people used to ask what design did in health, uh, I would respond by describing what I just did to you. Um, the problem was it was ultimately unsatisfying because uh, uh, my aspiration in life was to apply design in ways that actually shifted the function and the realities of the healthcare systems as we knew it. Um, and at, at IDEO, even though the work was tremendously fascinating and, and um, a great antidote to ADHD, um, it didn't allow us to actually solve for the problems at the core of the health systems. And so, um, so I left, I departed in 2014, and a week and a half later, 
uh, before my parents even knew, I got a call from an old friend who um, previously ran the largest NIH-funded uh, Clinical Translation Science Institute at UCSF. His name was Clay Johnston, and he had become the dean of a new medical school in Austin, Texas. So he called me up and he said, hey, I'm running a medical school in Austin. I'd really like to chat with you about um, starting in an academic institute, at which, at which point I laughed out loud. Because um, I told him, I said, you know I'm not an academic, not, not, by, the, uh, not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, he said, yeah, but let me tell you about the circumstances here, which, which I'll share with you now. So he began to tell me uh, a few things about what was going on in Austin. And as, he, as the story began to evolve, uh, it really sounded, sounded quite fantastical. So, um, so if any of you have been to Texas, um, uh, uh, and specifically Austin, you'll know that Austin is not, in, not like the rest of Texas at all. We often joke it's the blueberry in the, in the bowl of tomato soup. Um, so Austin is quite progressive, um, and uh, as evidence of such, in 2012, uh, the taxpayers in Travis County, which is the county that contains Austin, voted to raise their property taxes, the portion of it that's um, um, committed to uh, care for the underserved, they voted to raise that portion of their property taxes by 63%, which is quite significant. It generates annually about $100 million of revenue to serve the poor. Um, and that's even more notable when you uh, recognize that in the state of Texas, we have no income tax. Outside of sales tax, property taxes are the primary source of taxation and revenue for the state, that and the oil and the ground, which those of you in Alberta can appreciate. Um, and so, so that money was earmarked for a couple things. One was to, uh, to, to build uh, a new county hospital, which uh, was overdue. The existing hospital is um, about 40 years old. But interestingly, um, we built a hospital that was the same size as that 40-year-old hospital in this U.S. city that is the fastest growing city in the U.S. Uh, the last seven years running. So it, we are taking a very explicit bet that we believe that the model of care will move out of the traditional clinical environment and out into the community uh, and the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, uh, it funded a new medical school, so $35 million of that annually goes to the medical school. It is the first medical school at a tier one academic research university in the US in 50 years. And that's notable because any large university that wanted a, a medical center or a hospital or um, uh, had one and has had one for 100 years, uh, and in some ways they are complicit in the dysfunction of the US healthcare system because they have to continue to feed that beast um, with revenue through a traditional fee-for-service system. So when we came about, um, the dean uh, uh, explicitly disavowed fee-for-service as a model uh, for a business model for the, for the medical school and, this, and the clinics that it would run and said, we don't believe that serves society in the way um, uh, we should be. Uh, and because so much of our funding comes from the community, we're going to pursue an outcomes, a strictly value-based and outcomes-based uh, model in providing care for the indigent population in Texas. So that's quite remarkable. Um, but most importantly is the funding goes, the majority of the funding goes to a local payer, the local healthcare district, which pays for pair, uh, care for the underserved, also disavowed fee-for-service. And they have a huge lever because they have the pot of money. Um, they essentially force the providers in the community to evolve their practice towards outcomes-based care and value-based models as well. So with all of that, and he told me this in the course of you know, a couple hours on the phone, uh, I said, that sounds remarkable, also sounds like a fantasy. I will come and visit you in Austin. At best, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll consult uh, with you with the work um, that you're doing. Uh, three and a half months later, um, we had announced the institute, uh, and I had moved to Texas. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, so the, so the uh, um, Design Institute for Health was born out of that. Um, and really, the story is this. We, we rarely get an opportunity uh, to start from a blank slate. We really rarely get an opportunity to design a new model that embraces wholesale change. And that, you know, in the 20 years that I've been in healthcare was the first time I had ever seen that. I had worked with literally every academic medical center in the U.S. and many abroad. This was the first time I'd ever decided to join one. Uh, and so the Design Institute for Health is a collaboration between the medical school and the College of Fine Arts. Um, uh, uh, that's intentional. Um, it, it brings, um, uh, design is housed at the College of Fine Arts uh, in the University of Texas, and that's a little bit odd. Um, usually it's held somewhere uh, else inside a university. We have since launched a new school of design and creative technologies on the back of our arrival. Um, but uh, it's quite intentional because we get to draw from um, the resources of one of the premier public universities um, uh, in the United States, uh, and that is no small thing, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. So maybe to conclude maybe the introduction then to, to the Design Institute, 
Um, really what we have as leverage are a lot of different mechanisms. Um, we have a positive feedback model where the funding and the pair of providers actually are in a very tight loop and we can improve as we discover what works. Uh, we obviously have new financial incentives. The city is about a million people, small enough to be nimble, big enough to demonstrate scale. Um, we are training new physicians for that model. Um, essentially, we're taking a very system approach to this, um, and that is a place that design has has played a role in other industries, but almost never in healthcare. And, and we felt this was literally that once in a lifetime opportunity to try to see if we can make that happen. And so I uh, tell my colleagues all the time, we are just as likely to fail as we are to succeed, um, and, that, and fair warning. Um, but uh, it is um, a courageous effort uh, on behalf of all the folks I work with, and, um, and we hope uh, it'll uh, yield some things that, um, that are beneficial. So. I'll share with you a few things that um, we've been doing, um, and before I focus in on the one particular case study. Um, as designers I want to do, when we came to town, the first thing we asked was, um, so how is care funded and delivered in this county? Um, we'd love to know uh, how to design what's new based on uh, an understanding of what exists already. And exactly zero people had an answer to that. And so that is a classic dysfunction of the healthcare system, particularly in America, where very few people actually have a global view of how, how health care is delivered. Um, and, and funded as well. They have a very narrow view of how their one institution that gets paid and what they deliver, but rarely do they have a sense of how it works globally. And so we kept asking people until they got irritated, uh, at which point they said, well, if you're, so, if you're so inquisitive, why don't you build the model? <laughs> and, so, and so like a petulant teenager, we responded, sure, we will, I'll show you. And so we did. Uh, and we built this model and the paper version, which has been on our walls for the better part of about half a year. And everyone who walks by takes a picture of it from our region because they've never actually seen a comprehensive view of it. Our local politicians, providers, healthcare system leaders have never actually seen that view before. And they begin to understand their interactions with the rest of the system once they, once they uh, spend time with the map. We've actually developed a digital version which will go online within the month. Um, uh, and uh, here's the most important part of the, of, of the map. Uh, when, you, when you bring it up, the first disclaimer you see is this. This is a necessarily incomplete, possibly inaccurate, but urgently needed map of health delivery in Travis County. And our point is this, and this is actually quite indicative of design. Our, our, our aspiration is not to get this perfect or to be the authority. We are not traditional academics in that sense in particular. Our goal is not to impress somebody, but actually to see real change happen. And if we can inform, even through an imperfect characterization of the, of the local healthcare system, then we will have made progress. Ultimately, this is a shaming mechanism. When you put it online, it forces anybody who's named there to go, wait a minute, that's not what we do. At which point we say, good, tell us what you actually do then. Otherwise, we'll continue to characterize you this way. Uh, and so we've gotten great feedback because people want to be characterized accurately and there's some version of the truth in what they tell you. But more importantly, this is also a tool for planning policy for over time seeing how the system responds to changes in inputs. And so as policy changes, as funding models change, as diseases change, as the way we change our care models change, you'll see this map evolve. And it becomes a historical tracker of that in some ways. And eventually, uh, we should be able to set up scenarios where we uh, put inputs into the map and we can see it evolve, maybe to help us plan for the future as well. So that's one project. Um, that's very much a communications and system mapping tool. Um, we often work on technology as well. So under the umbrella notion of an exam room of the future, we're exploring quite a number of technologies for actually improving um, uh, the kind of uh, interactions that happen in exam rooms. Um, we believe in the primacy of the human relationship that you know, real care really happens. The primary value transaction in healthcare is in the conversation between a doctor or a, or a provider and a, and a patient. Um, and that technology has in many ways stripped that time away from them. Uh, and that if we actually return to a more humane model of care, then we will use technology in the opposite way, which is to return time to that relationship. So um, just uh, last month, we launched a, um, a, a, a joint venture, a startup with an MIT spin out using uh, uh, voice recognition to listen to the conversation in the exam room and to automatically fill in the electronic health record so that the physician doesn't spend his or her time primarily typing away. Um, and then the only role the physician has then is to actually look at the input and error correct if there is anything that needs to be fixed. Um, we're doing a fair amount of work in education as well as you would expect in a medical school. And so our medical curriculum is actually quite unique. So in the US traditionally you have a four year curriculum. The first two years are spent in the laboratory in the classroom, the third year in clinical rotations and the fourth year in some uh, more specific um, pursuits before they move on to their internship. 
um, we have convinced the accrediting authorities, which, who really are the gatekeepers, um, that we could use some of the learnings around how you educate uh, you know, modern educational models to squeeze those first two years into one. So we've done that. Um, they go do their second, uh, rotations in the second year, and then in the third year, um, we freed up entirely. So we freed up a quarter of the medical school um, curriculum. And our students are granted uh, the opportunity in that one year to get a, a degree, a master's, uh, um, um, an MBA in one year, or a master's of public health. They can get a degree in biomedical engineering, or in some cases, they can spend time with the Design Institute. And so um, it's remarkable only because um, for the first time, we're recognizing that in educating the physician leaders tomorrow, they need more than clinical skills. They actually need leadership skills. They understand how to run organizations, develop business models, develop services. And so um, we arrived after the first class of students um, had been admitted. Uh, and uh, I often joke, you can't underestimate the cult of personality. And so they're like, those guys dress a little bit different, and they don't sound like the rest of the folks around here. Could we hang out with them uh, during our third year? And we said, well, let's see what the interest is. And so we asked, and 28 of the 50 students in the first class said, yeah, we'd like to hang out with the design student, at which point we said, we can't, we can't take all of you. So um, we, we convinced them that we, they would be guinea pigs, it would be hard, and you know, there was no degree to be had. And so we managed to whittle it down to nine. So um, a fifth of the class is uh, actually spending their year with us, and we were giving them a very fast education in design, and also giving them an opportunity to avail themselves of the rest of the uh, university offerings and developing concentrations in either business model design, organizational design, service design, or communications. Uh, most of them are spending their time in organizational service and, and communications design because they recognize how important that will be when they become leaders in, in the systems uh, in the future. Um, so that is, um, we, we often joke, if we aren't actually uh, training uh, the future practitioners in the model that we're building, then we will have no one to, uh, to, to operate that model. Um, and then conversely, if we don't uh, build a model successfully and we train these students this way, we will have succeeded in making them unemployable. So we feel the dual pressure of actually doing both at the same time. Um, and then a couple other projects. We, are, um, we received a legislative grant uh, from the state of Texas to actually develop uh, the new mental health model for um, Central Texas, about a fifth of, of the Texas population. They were originally going to rebuild the original uh, uh, state asylum, which is essentially concrete walls with padded, uh, concrete rooms with padded walls. Uh, and we were fairly certain that wasn't going to be an appropriate model for, uh, for the future mental health uh, concerns that we had. So we, um, we convinced them to release about 5% of that funding to do it as a planning grant, and we've been developing a blueprint for what a modern mental health model looks like, screening, diagnostics, interventions, far before someone is committed to an asylum. Um, and that goes back to the legislature in, um, in January for consideration for full funding. And then finally, um, we are working on um, uh, significantly in the next year and a half on developing a new primary care model. So value-based care notions uh, uh, work really well in specialty care deployment. Um, they are not quite as, um, uh, how they manifest is quite, not quite as well known uh, in primary care. So we've been spending the last three years really trying to figure out how to better engage community around understanding their own needs uh, and then, um, and then sharing, manifesting that, sharing that with us, and then how we intervene on it. So we're working in two communities, one rural and one urban, to actually uh, deploy services that are combination social services and medical, um, really to address the determinants of health that actually matter most to this population. So that's a lot of hand-waving and a lot of talk. Um, but I want to get tangible, and in particular, I want to share with you a particular case study of work that we spent really about the first three years doing. So it was not the project we would have chosen. Uh, we were granted an empty shell of a building, which was originally designed for fee-for-service specialty clinics. Um, and, uh, and when the dean arrived and then we arrived, <clears throat> we, of course, disavowed that. And the dean asked the architects, so we have these design guys. They know a little bit about this. You know, maybe they could uh, offset some of your work. And they're like, oh, absolutely. Um, and the architects have regretted that ever since. <laughs> So, um, so the building was originally designed with a lot of coffin-like you know, exam rooms that are really appropriate for uh, basically pulling people in 10-minute points and shoving them back out. Uh, and if you understand the US healthcare system, that is essentially how it makes money. Every encounter is considered a revenue encounter. It's an opportunity to bill. And that's how the system survived. So we are obviously uh, in, uh, interested in deploying a very new model of care, um, what we call value-based care. Um, focused on outcomes. And, and explicitly, because of our local payer, um, we have new financial incentives in that model. Uh, we get paid when people get better, uh, which only makes sense. Uh, and so we looked at the existing patient experience and journey, and it looks something like this. This is a cartoon of it, 
but it is important to under, sort of understand um, what that experience is usually like. First of all, there's a lot of waiting, and most, much of that waiting happens um, uh, uh, you know, either in facility or you go away and you come back, right? You check in, you wait somewhere, and then you get triaged, maybe you'll wait somewhere else, you get your vitals taken, you'll wait in another place, and then you'll, you'll be a visitor serially in a number of different rooms that belong to physicians or other care providers, and then you may go away and get your blood drawn and come back and you'll wait again. It is really a disjointed experience and not one that produces outcomes either efficiently or, or, or comfortably. We've lost your slides. Oh, that's no good. Let's try this again. Keep going and I'll get wrong. If you... Yeah, let's try this. Aha, there we are. <clears throat> the Treviso technology. Um, so, so it looks... The, the, the traditional journey looks a little bit something like this, right? It, it, is, it is disjointed, um, it is unpleasant. It's not something you would design with an end user in mind. And clearly the system has not been designed with this end user, meaning the patient, in mind. And so we said, look, if we don't need uh, to bring people back and forth to treat, create individual revenue encounters, can't we do something a little more sensible and actually uh, much more human-centered? So we felt there was a, an opportunity to remake the experience not only for the patients, but also for the other humans in the system who are the providers. And sometimes we often forget that they are, the people who we ask to provide that care are also humans and they have needs and desires and aspirations as well. So still in a cartoon, we reimagined re it this way. You know, what if you were to check in, we were assigned you to a room in the specialty clinic and you were to dwell in that room for the entirety of your stay and that an entire team would come and they would intervene and they would uh, bring all the services that you might see over the course of several visits into one. And what if that visit wasn't 10 minutes or 12, but lasted for an hour and a half, and we can actually make real progress against your disease in one stay? Because frankly, anyone who comes for a 10-minute visit still misses a half day of work. You know, if we do an hour and a half, they'll miss the same half day of work. We might not have to bring them back for the subsequent five or six visits that for us are really just revenue uh, opportunities. We also took a couple other philosophical approaches. One was to separate the front and the back of house. And this is borrowed from other industries. If you've been to a good restaurant, you've been to a good theater, what happens behind the scenes is hidden from, from view for a good reason. Um, there are, re you know, in the back of house, you have uh, needs for efficiency, throughput, uh, for all sorts of things that don't make for a great experience on the front of house. You don't see the, the chef chopping the head off the, off the fish, you know, from the dining room. And there's a reason for that. And so we said, look, if we were, were to borrow some of that, could we create a better model, not from an, just an experience standpoint, but also um, from um, an, an effect, uh, uh, um, effectiveness standpoint uh, for the providers as well? And as designers, again, want to do, um, we anchored all of this work in understanding what we're trying to do for each set of the humans in the system. So for both the patients and the providers, we were quite ex explicit about the principles that we wanted to adhere to. What did it actually, what were we trying to actually do on behalf of um, each of those sets of humans and the experience that they were going to have? Making the patient actually the center of experience instead of just paying lip service to it. Uh, giving them, setting some expectations ahead of the time because anxiety is a huge uh, detractor from the experience. Giving them control over some aspects of the journey. Engaging the informal caregivers. Who's going to take care of the patient after they leave the clinical environment? More than likely their family. They should be involved in the care while they're in the clinical environment. And then actually decreasing the authority gap, especially with uh, uh, modern chronic disease, patients need to be more enabled and empowered to actually take, their, uh, take, uh, take charge of their care. We should uh, um, give them some role in that. And for pr the providers who are often beset upon by the system's needs, we wanted to give them some control over their, they could, we could create flexibility in space, allow them to manipulate it as they need it, give them uh, um, power to actually define their own roles and evolve the model as necessary. So um, since we're in, in Calgary and I can't take you on a tour uh, in person, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a virtual tour and then I'll tell you about actually the real work beyond what we did. So um, when you enter our clinics, it does not look like a traditional medical clinic. It looks actually more like an airport concourse than anything else and that's quite intentional. So first of all, because we separated the front and back of the house, we could actually carpet the front. We could do things that don't make it loud, obnoxious, and shiny. Um, and uh, we give people, when they arrive, if you, because we know you're coming, um, uh, reasonably, if you come within 10 to 15 minutes of your appointment, you um, uh, will be shown directly to your room and you dwell in that room for the entirety of your stay. We have no waiting rooms. We eliminated them. 
Uh, if you arrive a little, uh, an hour early, and some little old ladies still show up an hour early because they've been trained to do that their entire lives, um, <clears throat> we give you choice. We don't put you in a gray box with a, uh, with a loud television and a, and, a, and a stale fish tank and force you to look at other sick people. We give you choice. You have an option to f uh, find an alcove that fits you. There's free Wi-Fi. There's plugins. You can go downstairs to the cafe. There's a learning lounge and a library staffed by allied health professionals who can help you learn about your condition and the, deci and the decisions you'll have to make. But you essentially grant them control over that aspect of the journey. Um, we either give them a restaurant pager if they don't have a cell phone or we ask for their um, or the text number so that we can text them when the room's available and then, and then we show them to the room. The room itself belongs to them. There's a front door um, which they can close and lock. Never been in a patient room that can do that. Um, uh, so that when they disrobe, they uh, are comfortable that no one will do the knock and open door um, maneuver, which uh, happens so often. Um, inside the room, we're running a couple different prototypes. One that shows your staff and care team um, that will be meeting with you and some of the problems that you're here to address, which we know because they're in the EHR and we've collected those uh, patient reported outcomes uh, before they came. In some, uh, uh, some of the clinics, we're actually running live video, uh, not live video, recorded video of the clinicians greeting them personally. We have um, embedded RFID so that um, real-time location services. So when you arrive in the room, we actually know that you're there, we can actually greet you, and then we actually know you're in the room too, so we won't lose you. Um, we've designed the room to, uh, to all be low seating. Um, uh, all of our staff are trained to seat, sit while they engage with the patient. The beds are never laid out as beds because actually the majority of visits are done while they're sitting anyway. Um, there's nothing worse than walking into uh, a women's health clinic and having the stirrups already up. Right, and you walk and you're like, oh, I suppose this is what this is about, right? <laughs> so we're really trying to uh, help alleviate some of the anxiety um, that, that comes into the room. Um, we learned that uh, the room actually has to talk to. It has a personality. Um, it tells the patients who have been well-trained uh, to not touch anything in the exam room. We have to convince them that actually this room belongs to them. There's a cabinet that says, this is for your things. You'll be here a while. Put it away. You can adjust the lights. You can lock the door. Um, uh, you can change the TV channel if you'd like. Uh, it is actually, it was one of the things that we discovered that was the most difficult. The patients have actually been trained how to behave in medical environments as well, and we have to unprogram that, reprogram it. And then in the back of house, and this is a little bit of a blueprint, we've designed it so that um, uh, uh, the back of house, there's a bullpen where all the nurses, physicians, social workers, nutritionists, financial counselors, they all work shoulder to shoulder. And, and it's a little bit of an intentional manipulation. Um, because we've realized over the years designing in healthcare that you know, the formal consult has some value, but it's the informal curbside that really uh, engenders much of the uh, value transactions between providers. And so if you can encourage people to run into each other more often, you can actually prescribe interactions, but you can enable them, and the model of care gets better because there's better communication. So um, in the back of house, this is, and I promise you, this is not actually a staged photo. Um, this is what it looks like in our back of house. And so um, the gentleman seated on the right is the head of the clinic. He's an orthopedic surgeon. We have a social worker, a caseworker, a nurse. We actually have a researcher in the back as well. And they continuously run into each other and work. Um, and it allows them to go, oh, you know, I forgot to ask you about patient. You know, we need to titrate the medication for patient X. Those things happen more naturally um, because of the design of, of the space itself. So I suppose the, one of the headlines of this work is that um, uh, we eliminated the waiting rooms. And, uh, and I don't view that as a particularly um, huge innovation, but apparently other people do. I, I viewed it as a provocation. Because as soon as you eliminate the waiting rooms, um, you force the system to behave very differently than it traditionally has. Not only in its respect for the patient, but also operationally, how do you actually supply, and I'll use that term for a second, patients um, to the physicians at a pace and effectively so that the system continues to work at capacity. So I'll tell you that the work, the hardest work was not actually designing the model or the services, service blueprint or the technology or the, or the, um, the rooms and the, and the space itself. The, the hardest work was actually in organizational change to develop the courage amongst our colleagues to actually embrace the kind of change that we all believed would make a difference, but we we're all concerned um, had not been done before. So I'll share with you um, six objections um, each of them turned into a fist fight that I had to endure for about two years before we could actually see this come to, to the fore. And I'll, and I'll leap to the end, which is the clinics have been open now for a year. The, the elimination of the waiting rooms is a complete non-issue. Uh, it, it, we figured it out operationally. It works perfectly fine. But the amount of vitriol and, and, and anger and discussion about whether or not we could possibly do this 
um, was unending for two years. And, and when you understand where it comes from, it comes from a good place, or it comes from a legacy place, um, you understand that it was, it was, a, it, it was worth uh, working on. But uh, I'll talk about um, specifically the, the challenges that we had. And they all come in quotes. So the first one was this. This was from the architect. So we sat down, <clears throat> and they opened their binder of specification. They had built 15 specialty clinics in the last five years. They were experts in, in this. And they sat down, and they're like, all right, so where do you want your waiting rooms? And we said, um, I don't think we're going to do waiting rooms. Uh, and they said, oh, yeah, but everyone has waiting rooms. And I said, well, just because everyone has waiting rooms doesn't mean we have to have waiting rooms. At which point, the architect very clo slowly closed his binder <laughs> uh, and realized that this was going to be a very difficult conversation. So we were quite adamant about it. Um, and I had, uh, um, I had an air cover from the dean who had basically declared from the mount, we will have no waiting rooms. You guys go figure it out. I was the one told him to do that. Um, and then I walked in and said, all right, well, the dean said there's no waiting room, so we better figure it out. So we worked through that over the course of two years. And the architects, you know, they demanded that they, we run simulations. I was like, have you ever run a simulation in a value-based care model without waiting rooms? They're like, no. I said, well, therefore, you have no data to convince us that it won't work. The only way to do this is a discovery-based approach. So we'll build prototypes, first in foam core, in addicts, and then we'll run some physicians through. And then eventually, you know, in increasing complexity, so we started running mock operations in a perfectly designed space to, that mimicked what it was. And we realized we could actually solve all the issues that we thought were, were going to be a prob problematic. And it was only at that point that the architects believed that we can move forward with it. They are now our best friends. And, and the reason is they joined their professions to actually do groundbreaking work. And they've rarely, and especially in healthcare, given, been given the permission to actually do groundbreaking work. And for this, for them, this is actually um, you know, one of the shining stars in their portfolio. I had a conversation uh, with uh, the chief clinical officer who, who told me, she said, well, if we don't have waiting rooms, where will I get my patients from? And I asked her to pause for a moment and actually consider what she was asking. I said, so you're really concerned about whether or not the patient arrives at the same time you do in the room. Is that right? She's like, yes. I said, so if we can guarantee the patient arrives when you're available, do you care that they come from a waiting room? Her answer was, well, I guess not. So, um, so we went a bit further. We actually, because we reassign the rooms to the actual patients, we make the physicians circulate. We don't make them walk a lot. Um, they walk maybe 20 feet in, in any direction. But actually, they have even more control over their schedule because you know, in our visits, which last an hour and a half, there are a lot of professionals to actually see. And, and the coordination can sometimes be a little squidgy. Um, but the, the, the primary physician who's responsible can actually un understand where each of the room is in their protocol and, and figure out where to go next. And she has more control now than she did previously over um, uh, who she sees and when she sees them. Um, so we managed to overcome that as well. And then with the staff, they, um, they started asking this question, which was, are we really going to give patients control? Um, and really at the heart of that was this notion that it was a zero-sum game. If we gave patients control, then we would lose control. And that's obviously not true. And so as we began to work through the model, and we shared with them the kind of control we wanted to give patients, control over their environment, control a little bit over um, the unallocated time before the appointment, control over um, who came in and went with them into the room, we asked the, the clinicians, is that the control you're concerned about? They're like, no, not really. We said, in that case, you retain the control you have over helping them uh, overcome their disease or, or, or prescribe their therapies, but we're also giving the patients control of some of the experience that they've never had before. And I often liken it to this. Um, before I worked in healthcare, I did a lot of work in transportation, and we treat our patients like airplanes, uh, airlines treat passengers. Right? So passengers have been stripped of all control. You're told when to sit, when to stand, when the lights come on, uh, when, the meals, uh, you know, uh, when the meal is served. And so what do patients fight over? The only thing they have control over, which is the armrest. Right? And so that's what you end up with. You end up with patients who rail on the only things they have control over if we don't grant them control over some of the other things. And by granting them some control, it actually alleviates some of their anxiety and puts them in a better state of mind. And it's remarkably, it's remarkable how different patients are when they arrive in our exam rooms than when they do in traditional ones. Then we had this conversation. <clears throat> so um, the Design Institute predated all but two of the clinical chairs. But by the time we launched clinics, there were quite a number around. And every one of them would tell us, uh, my clinic operates differently than the others. And they would say secretly, and much better uh, and than the others. Um, uh, the first two uh, clinic, um, clinical specialties we had were ob and, um, and orthopedics. And you could not have picked traditionally two specialties that were more likely to be at loggerheads with each other. And so we said, look, um, um, tell us about what amongst your practice in this new model will be common, will be the same. 
Uh, and they said, well, 90% of it's different, and the 10% is the same. We do better anyway. And so we put them through six months of process, and eventually what they realized was about 90% of it was actually the same. The 10% they were doing was worse than the others. And so um, we actually succeeded, and we considered this one of our biggest coups, in actually developing a common service blueprint for every single specialty clinic, and we have about 12 now. So it doesn't matter if you're multiple sclerosis, uh, women's health, uh, orthopedics, uh, pain, um, cognitive disorders, it, it doesn't matter. They are the cancer clinic. We all abide by the same. And we leave enough variability to accommodate for the, the nuances in each specialty. But otherwise, they're exactly the same. And what that allows us to do, the standardization, it allows us to put a, raise a much higher bar for the foundational level where everybody begins so that we can then move on beyond that. Um, the frontline staff asked, what if we lose the patient? You know, if, if we assign them in the room and they disappear in the room, we don't know where they are, uh, you know, we might find them a week later and it'd be bad. And we said, all right, well, we'll work on that. It's actually wayfinding. And we borrowed as an analogy something from the transportation industry, which was the boarding pass. So we did very careful wayfinding. We actually label the floors by number, the hallways by letter, and the rooms by number. And when they arrive at the concierge, we give them a boarding pass that assigns them to the room. We've never lost a patient, because actually most of us are pretty good at finding a hallway and a room number. We do that in every hotel we go to. Um, and, and so we solve for that problem. But then the very last one, which completely threw me for a loop, was when the EHR vendor said, oh, you have to have a waiting room for our EHR to work. <laughs> Pause for a moment and recognize what they're saying. So that is very much the tail wagging the dog the tool telling you how the model of care should work. They said, well, you know, we have stage gates in our EHR, and what happens is, you know, you have to collect a lot of, you know, pertinent information before you can assign the room. You can't assign the room until all of this completed, and that's the last step before, you know, you can assign the room only after you've collected all the vitals and a number of other things. And then, therefore, you have to have a waiting room where you do this work before you assign them to the actual exam room where they're going to live. And we said, we could probably tweak the software to do that. And they're like, well, we've never done it before, at which point we said, well, I guess you will now. So I'll conclude by saying, uh, really, the real work is not about the new model. Most of us can, uh, can build a new model. Um, ah, there's an announcement here, so apologies. Um, the real work is that actually not about um, imagining a new model and bringing it to fruition. Um, that's not the hard work. Um, most of us can understand how a model, a better model can work. Um, the real challenge, honestly, is about uh, the courage to change and helping organizations overcome um, their reticence and actually develop uh, um, a willingness to embrace uncertainty. And, uh, and that's the work that uh, has consumed, actually, most of our time. So I'll end there. Thank you. So at this point, I think we're taking questions, yes? So, Stacy, thank you very much for a yeah. very enlightening <laughs> presentation, and uh, we'll uh, entertain some questions, and um, maybe I'll start. And, and certainly, I would look forward to an environment where I'm an emergency physician, so we'd look at an environment where we have no waiting rooms in emergency departments. Have you ever entertained that uh, thought? Yeah, well, so uh, this, is, this is where we, we come, come clean, right? The, the notion of no waiting rooms is actually not the most important aspect of this, and it doesn't um, necessarily uh, carry over to every environment. In an emergency room, not everyone who comes in is expected, right? And so in this model, we certainly can. But I think the more important notion is that in that unallocated time, um, you can give, you can do productive things. It can be active time. So if someone arrives at, a, at an emergency room and they're not ready to be seen yet, what will you use that time for in, in, pr in pursuit of better care and better outcomes? That's the question we, we would prefer to ask. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I'll open it up to uh, here, the Foothills Medical Center, if there's any questions from folks in the audience. I have a really practical question, actually. Sure. Um, I worked on a project at the beginning of the year to sort of standardize processes for outpatient clinics mm -hmm. here, well, here in Calgary. And one of the struggles that we had was, the, I guess, related to the limitations of how we were able to schedule and then communicate appointment types to Mm -hmm. And I, I just love all your ideas. So how, how are you communicating appointments to patients? Are you calling them first? Are you blind booking? Or? Um, so we have a fairly high-touch relationship with our patients. Um, one of the things we've taken advantage for, I'm sorry, do I need to repeat the question or is that, could that be heard? 
Um, the question was about how do you schedule appointments with patients, particularly in outpatient settings. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a fairly high touch relationship with our patients because we, we're responsible for them globally, but um, we also assume they know how to use technology. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we do early on is actually ask them what a, a positive outcome for them actually looks like. So we be actually begin by engaging them you know, in that dialogue because uh, their measure of success, in, in essence, becomes our measure of success. Alongside that, then, we begin to ask them, you know, what are the, when, when can you come in? When is convenient? And then we start using that intelligence to actually schedule for them. Um, uh, uh, we have the technology in place, uh, but we haven't turned it on yet, which is um, one of the biggest challenges of scheduling is that it's a little bit unpredictable, right? You know, the appointment may run long, people, but there's no reason we can't actually tell you that, you know, don't come just yet. Actually, you won't be, a, or your appointment time um, uh, won't be, you won't, we won't be ready for you for another half hour or whatever, things like that. Um, and, the th and the truth of the matter is we do that all the time at restaurants. I get texts from restaurants like, don't come yet. Now show up. Now your appointment, you know, your, your table is ready. Um, and uh, that flexibility actually affords us some um, operational efficiency on the backside as well, but also is really lovely for the patients. So, so we use a little bit of intelligence, a little bit like giving them a Cosmo sex service first and saying, like, what do you prefer? And then actually divining, like, when we should schedule them and then and offering them those times and then preserving some flexibility um, uh, on the day of to accommodate so we don't actually frustrate them when they arrive. I don't know. Did that answer your question? Okay, good. So for those who want to, I'll, I'll take more questions. For those who a reminder that if you're not at the Foothills, you can email your questions at pss at ahs.ca. So just a reminder. Take another question. We have a question by email. Yes, question by email. Um, it says, thank you, Stacy, for a tremendously inspiring presentation. As you may be aware, we are in the early stages of planning of a build for a new hospital campus in Southwest Edmonton and engaging with patients and families to gain the wisdom and insights from their lived experience is critical to our success. Do you have any advice to help us optimize the partnership between our patient and family advisors and our design teams for this exciting project? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the most important aspect of our work, especially from a design standpoint, is that we don't ever prescribe and then ask people to give feedback. Um, we take it more like a co-design session. So um, the worst thing you can do is to, is to build something that's really um, tightly defined and well-finished. Because when someone comes in, and you all are Canadian, so I think this would make it even more sense, you know, are quite polite. You know, they, don't want to, they don't want to tell, your baby is, tell you your baby is ugly, right? <laughs> and so if you do something that's really, really well refined and put, obviously put a lot of effort into it, they're going to be polite and say, yeah, that, that looks nice. And you won't get the kind of feedback you really need. And so often we build intentionally rough prototypes and ask people to come in. And then they're like, well, you only spent like a day building this, so you, know, you, know, you, you won't be too upset if I tell you that you know, some things need to be improved. Um, but we bring them in and one of the, uh, bring them in and have them live through the scenario and things like that. But he, he, here's the most important part. Most people are not sufficiently capable, not because they don't want to, um, but aren't sufficiently capable of actually think, telling you everything that they're thinking and feeling. You know, they can sort of, you know, in a survey or focus group, sort of answer the questions you know to ask. It's the un, unknown questions, the ones that you don't know to ask, where the insight really resides. And those things actually emerge when you actually um, uh, bring people in and allow and, and uh, observe and allow them to experience what you're imagining uh, and learning in, 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 the, in situ. So, um, so we tend to build a lot of prototypes, most of them not very refined, and they get increasingly refined as, as we go along but allowing um, the people in the system, and that's both the patients and the providers, to help us design the system as we go. Thank you. There are some other folks in uh, Verna? So Stacy, you make an assumption when you're doing some of the planning work that there's a certain level of health literacy. They have access to smartphones. And so what have you done for those who don't have that, who don't understand English? How have you adapted some of your work to those most vulnerable? So it's a really good question. So we, we don't presume, actually, that everyone um, has a smartphone, although in Austin, 86% of the population has a smartphone. So it's actually a pretty fair assumption that most people have smartphones. We also don't presume they have a certain level of literacy or, or health literacy. Um, but um, the problem is when you design for the lowest common denominator, then the experience is actually um, poor for those who are at, at the top of the, um, of the bell curve. And so. So 
our view of it is not to move to the lowest little literacy level and design at that level because it's just frustrating for people who want to move more quickly and, and, and actually have the engagement to move more quickly. So we design to enable and allow those who can move quickly to, to progress, but we also accommodate those who cannot. Um, and a lot of that actually is contained not in technology or process and service, it's actually contained in the human element. So we hire explicitly for people who are sensitive to that and have the skills to engage if the existing normal engagement um, is too advanced or too you know, uh, digital for, for the population. Um, and that's a, that's a change in mindset. Oftentimes, healthcare says, okay, well, we'll have to design a third grade literacy for someone who's, not re who's reading at a you know, college of literacy. It's really frustrating and therefore ineffective. So it's a bit of a mindset shift. Other questions that we may have? Um, I have a few. Um, so we have somebody. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you have a few. So okay, go ahead. I, I can yeah. I'll ask one more. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to make rapid change in an organization. Do you have any advice on how we can use design thinking to help address that? Yeah, it is difficult to make rapid change. It's difficult to make change <laughs> in organizations, never mind rapid change. Um, and so one of the challenges over the course of my career uh, I've discovered is when you make it um, too big to fail, um, it's really hard. Uh, and it gets deployed at large scale, and, and really the only response that those who are being asked to make the change have is to say yes or no, and oftentimes they say no. Um, and so the biggest difference, at least from a design approach, is actually developing those changes at smaller scale. So testing, you know, if you have one small innovation on a service line, let's test that first. And if it's good, people will actually adopt it. You don't actually have to, con you don't have to deploy it. The whole notion of deployment, if it makes their lives better, they'll just adopt it. And we've done that work across a lot of service lines, both nurses and, and physicians and, and others as well. So it's about actually turning the initiatives into as small as possible. Like what, what, can, what is the smallest unit of change that we can push out and, and, um, and see if it actually works? Uh, that's important because it de-risks those, those challenges, right? What's the cost of failure if it only took a week and $100 to develop? Actually, very little. And the learning you derive from that will be much greater in aggregate. And so the, the stepwise progression is actually much more effective in creating change than the large-scale deployment. Um, we've all seen those happen before, right? And they either, they either work or they disappear and no one talks about them. <laughs> Stacey, I love the uh, like the design and the concept that it endorses, and like the culture that I think that comes with that. It, it's something that I, I can aspire towards. I'm a manager for a variety of outpatient clinics, and I think about the the volume and the throughput through those clinics. And I'm just curious around like the the design and like how that matches with volume. Yeah. Can Can you help me? Well, so volume is. Um is a, is a consequence of your reimbursement model, or it certainly is in the US. And so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna share with you the painful truth, which is you really can't have real healthcare reform without payment reform. And so we're the beneficiaries of a very unique payment reform model in our locale, under the umbrella of much larger payment reform happening at the national level in the US. Um, and that's driving a tremendous amount of change. And so um, it doesn't have to be at that level. It doesn't, you know, we are, we are the beneficiaries of some pretty large scale payment reform, but even at a small scale, um, as, as our local payer is actually um, uh, experimenting with how you manage complex primary care patients with multiple chronic diseases, they're releasing very small incentive payments just to see, just to see if there are experiments that can um, manifest in better outcomes. Um, and that, that is, um, I think, the most effective way we've seen change happen is actually to tweak a little bit of the financial circumstances and see if we can make change on the outcomes as well. In many cases, it's not about, you know, it's not about undermining the existing uh, financial model for you know, some of your providers. It's saying, we'll de-risk the experimentation by covering your loss in pursuit of something that we all know can be better. So, um, so that's sort of the, the harsh answer, which is, you know, if, if volume, is really um, still your primary um, uh, uh, metric, um, then you might have to revisit that metric. Well, I think access is Access is certainly, uh, we would say outcome is, right? Volume is, is, not a, is an imperfect, imperfect surrogate for outcomes. And really, you know, uh, on behalf of society, we're in pursuit of outcomes more than we are in volume. Yeah. Uh -huh. One question I have, uh, 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 Stacey, is, 
you've done obviously some great innovative work with regards to how to deliver the services, the services at the clinic. So for those patients that are complex and multiple uh, health issues, often the solution is not medical, it's yeah. outside the clinic. So what work have you done, for example, with the city of Austin or yeah. some other community providers in terms of you know the continuity of care and some of the other services that are critical to what's happening in your clinic, actually. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, success is not, at a, at, a, at a community level, is not made by making one specialty care clinic better. That's for certain. Um, you know, and then the, the specialty clinics we launched are essentially there to fill gaps in care uh, that the current uh, indigent population doesn't have access to, so that's why we launched those. But um, ultimately, you have to coordinate much far better uh, in order for what happens in specialty clinics to be matched with primary care, to match with the work that goes on at home with friends and family and individuals. So coordination is, is actually the biggest piece. Um, and so um, we're working with a number of parties um, uh, in the region uh, who we don't have authority over to try to align uh, incentives. Everybody wants better outcomes, so that's easy. Everybody wants more effective models of care, that's easy. Um, but there are actually no coordinating entities, and that's actually the, the hardest work we're doing. That happens on some front, on the IT front, but mostly it's in the in the care providers and the um, sorry the the caseworkers um, that are actually uh, leading the teams. So it's a it's a huge reorientation. We don't actually think of physicians as the lead of the team. We think of the caseworkers as the leads of the team because they're the ones who are actually knitting together all the different aspects that re will result in a better outcome. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions? Um, When you design a built space, such as a floor on the hospital you talked about, do you take security considerations into account? That is, clear sight lines, exits, and entrances clearly marked, et cetera. Yeah, we absolutely do. Yeah, so we don't get to disavow good, um, uh, good environment design. The architects ensure that. Um, but even further, we have to take it, you know, when you're doing work uh, with patients who can get agitated, you know, in, in, in psych and other things like that, we have to be really mindful of that. And that's both for the safety of the providers and the patients. So we do spend quite a bit of time with that. And, um, and here's, you know, I'll, I'll sort of answer this uh, with an addenda, which is um, design actually hates working in blue sky scenarios because um, uh, they mostly turn into sort of interesting fairy tales. Um, working with constraints is really where the hard work happens and where you can um, uh, demonstrate how you can actually shift systems uh, productively. So we, we embrace those uh, constraints. So, well, thank you very much, uh, Stacy, for your, uh, uh, your very interesting presentation and enlightening presentation. Um, on behalf of um, the Health Services, it's a small momentum. <laughs> thank you. Very Albertan and Canadian. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you.